Okay, whatever the first response is I see to this tweet is what I'm gonna say. The fantasy news must start. <laughs> welcome, welcome, welcome everybody to another episode of Fantasy News. I am your disheveled goblin host, Daniel Green, and today we have a nice little charcuterie board of fantasy news to sneaky snack our way through. Yeah. Suing because of undulate, really. It's a work. Yeah, I paid Sean Astin to say it. I don't. I'm recording fantasy. Yeah, I got someone who can cover for me. Okay, I'll be there in a minute. Beautiful as I remember. Oh. Hello there, everybody. Don't you worry about that goblin man. I've been told he's embryoed in some legal litigation with another YouTuber named Murphy Napier. I promise, I didn't harm a hair on his head. You can have a look at him right now. Oh, do you agree with that, Daniel? Does that feel like a good point? Would you like the to- The only thing you've said I agree with is that your content is unwatchable. Mr. Gr so without any further ado, let's jump into the fantasy news. Now our first story today revolves around the Lord of the Rings IP. That little old company embracer that swept up a bunch of Lord of the Rings rats over the summer says the franchise has the potential to be as big as Marvel or Star Wars. Cross the interwebs, people have been having a reaction to this where they think this means they're going to try and crank out a bunch of Lord of the Rings movies. Personally believe they're getting this news confused with old news about a potential pitch for that style adaptation of Lord of the Rings. That's not what's being said here. This is in reference to the fact that a transmedia strategy is going to be taken on where we're getting new Lord of the Rings board games, video games. If you look at the numbers, it's surprising for how old Lord of the Rings is, how far behind things like Star Wars and Marvel, or specifically the MCU it is. Personally, as long as one in three of these pieces of media that are released are quality, I'm okay with it, and I'm willing to let the more mediocre adaptations fade to memory. I do believe it is important for us to remember we love these IPs for a reason, and doing more with them is not inherently a bad thing. Now with my voice getting mighty tired, let's go ahead and check in with that goblin man's legal troubles. I am going to be contacting Sean Astin during this recording, as he has agreed, uh, to be a part of this so if you would not mind we will now begin the testimony of sean astin did you pay sean to lie that testimony is now on the record thank you do i get to see this testimony or is this just something that you fabricated once he he, he prefers to be contact through ouija i'll allow that thank you damn it i gotta keep going oh hey uh no you don't oh, oh really i just bribed jake with six dollars and he ruled in my favor immediately oh thank god all right i will update you on the legal troubles between miss napier and i as they develop but i think in what will be received as near universally positive news rick royden has said that in 2023 we will be getting another book entry into the percy jackson story this book was initially conceived as a sweetener to help get another adaptation of his works done apparently just pitching it to things like as it got eventually picked up by Disney by saying, hey, I will also be releasing a book in the time frame of your big media hype up for this release for you. And I think that's actually a really smart strategy. As for the exact context of what this book will be, titled Chalice of the Gods, Percy and his friends must assist Zeus's cupbearer in retrieving the missing chalice, a magical artifact capable of granting immortality to those who drink from it. There will be other gods we haven't seen, Royden said. It's going to continue the Percy Jackson tradition of encountering gods and monsters, and it takes place mostly in and around New York City. It's not meant to be a world-ending adventure, it's just a day in the life of a demigod. And I like that pitch quite a bit. I personally, as I've said many times before, am not the biggest Percy Jackson or Olympians fan, but I do think the guy's fan base seems to be really happy around this from what I've seen in general. And from what I understand, the guy isn't known for just like throwing out books that don't need to be there, so yay! Congratulations for the Percy Jackson fans for not only getting an adaptation down the road that the actual author seems to be heavily involved in, yay, but an additional book too. Let me know what you think of this if you're a fan in the comments down below. But it would not be a good fantasy news if that did not work at all. 
But it wouldn't be a good fantasy news if we didn't have some cover reveals. And you'll love to see it, Patrick Leo got to reveal The Tyranny of Faith by Richard Swan. Personally, this isn't a style I typically like for book covers, but I do appreciate how well this one seems to be done. I like, I'm like, oh, that's not my style, but no, I wouldn't mind that on my shelf at all. The Tyranny of Faith is the epic sequel to the Sunday Times best-selling debut, The Justice of Kings, where Sir Conrad Van Vault, the most powerful and feared of the Emperor's justices, must face down a growing threat to the Empire. A justice's work is never done. But bringing in another massive franchise to this episode of Fantasy News, we also need to talk about the cover reveal for the upcoming Cyberpunk 2077, No Coincidence. Coming to bookstores in August 2023, I've even seen some really big fans of the Cyberpunk 2077 game surprised to hear this, but this is a world that's been around for a while and had entries put into it all the way back since it was first established in a board game. But this entry in the Cyberpunk universe was written by Raphael Kosick. And this one I will probably pick up, not only because of my own affinity for Cyberpunk, Cyberpunk and the fact that I am currently finishing off writing a cyberpunk book, but the cyberpunk world I find to be a really great execution and thoroughly built at least in terms of world building for cyberpunk. So especially if you're someone who's thinking about writing cyberpunk stuff, I recommend just looking into the lore around Night City because it's pretty damn well done. But we're going to jump on from here into some video game news because wow, Silent Hill just got a bit of a renaissance. Not only is another Silent Hill movie been confirmed to be coming down the road from the director of the first one, which they are saying will largely be faithful to the second game, but that second game is also getting a remaster for current generation standards, dope, and on top of that, another Silent Hill game has been announced. Silent Hill, I know it's supposed to be Silent Hill F, but it's way more fun to go Silent Hill. I am a huge fan of horror movies. Horror games though, being in them scares me so much more. And I've never played the Silent Hill games, but I've been looking for a game to stream on Twitch for the Halloween season. So I might give the first Silent Hill a go. I was kind of disappointed by Dead Space as I already covered here. And I tried another one, I forget the title was, but it was just like immediately for some reason too scary. So maybe Silent Hill will be the one. <laughs> the only question I have for Silent Hill fans was the first movie good? Because the hype for the second movie seemed like a lot of people were really happy with the first, but that breaks from the established lore of there being no great video game adaptations. So is this a pretty good one that people just don't talk about? Or is this video just acting like it was really good? but it wasn't. I'm gonna check the Rotten Tomatoes score and put it right here. But in one last piece of mega franchise news, we need to talk about the recent Dune announcement that apparently Dune's sisterhood and Denis Villeneuve's Dune Part 2 are gonna be filming at the same time. Both will be filming November of 2022, with Dune's sisterhood specifically announced to now be filming in Budapest. And I think a lot of the people who argue that Lord of the Rings specifically shouldn't have too many more adaptations due to the fact that it feels like it's such a hyper-specific set of stories and best in book and there's a lot of people who believe that for Middle Earth and I don't think they're entirely wrong. I can just separate adaptations I think a lot easier than some other people, which, you know, there's nothing wrong or right about that. Dune, on the other hand, is something where I would actually really like to see this universe explored more in various adaptations. I'm one of the people, and I know I might get some people going, what? about this. I like the immediate Dune sequels more than the first Dune book, and seeing some adaptations that would bring in some of the zanier, wilder elements from those later entries I think could be a lot of fun, especially in games or shows and movies, so I'm here for it. I like how weird Frank Herbert got. I'm not gonna read past book four or five wherever I stop, though, because I've heard it goes downhill. I just ask if you make a Dune video game. You gotta let me ride a Dune worm at some point. I wanna ride a Dune worm into a city in Kaiju it up. Please just give that to me. I do a lot of things for that. And in the final story of the day, there has been some drama around the Bayonetta franchise, specifically revolving around the voice acting for the titular character Bayonetta. Very popular voice actor within the video game world, Jennifer Hale, was brought in to voice the character instead. The original voice actress in a video that now has over 10 million views came out claiming she was offered an insultingly low pay for returning to the franchise to voice it for the newest game. The original voice actress even then called for fans to boycott the next entry and instead donate the money they would use to buy that game to charity? But after this story came out, some people began asking questions and certain things seemed to not line up with her claims. All while various voices related either to the game or industry kept weighing in and giving their thoughts. Finally, an article was dropped by Bloomberg where counterclaims were put forward and some evidence showed that yes, in her initial argument, this voice actress was not exactly 
exactly being truthful. Instead, they were being offered around $1,000 for each hour of their work, resulting in a pay of closer to $20,000. The original voice actress, Helena Taylor, after these counterclaims were brought forward, essentially just said, I want to be done with this whole drama and refused to bring forth any additional evidence for her side of things. So now it seems in general, most people are siding with Jennifer Hale and the people behind the Bayonetta franchise as a whole and seeing Helena Taylor as someone who has been dishonest. And obviously, I wouldn't exactly consider myself on Helena Taylor's side here, especially with how likely it seems to be that she just lied. But if she had come out and just said the actual facts of I'm being offered around 15 to 20K total for this amount of work, I would have still got it if she turned it down. I am not saying Jennifer Hale or even necessarily the company is in the wrong. Definitely Helena Taylor is in the wrong, but it's still insane to me that someone returning for a third entry in a game franchise who voices the main character is only being paid 20K. As someone who has spent years talking about how much I love various narrators for my favorite audiobooks, and yes, incredible performances within video games that absolutely can like make the game, $20,000 is still an insultingly low paycheck in my opinion, especially for a franchise as freaking big as Bayonetta. So my general take now is screw Helena Taylor unless she's able to provide some evidence, which should be very easy to do that that's a lie and no, she was only offered the incredibly low amount she initially claimed. I don't feel great towards the Bayonetta people though, because I think they're taking part of an industry problem where voice actors are criminally underpaid. And Jennifer Hale, you're still cool. I like your work a lot. And I'm not trying to be like biased in saying that Jennifer Hale is great. I actually think Helena Taylor's work in the past has been really good too. She just seems like a kind of person I now wouldn't want to work with. It should be really easy to provide evidence that no, you were offered the pay you're claiming. But then like at the end of the situation when people say, okay, prove what you're saying to be like, no. That's not gonna get me or anyone else on your side. But the final thing I wanna say on this is I am still just a YouTuber who is reading articles and conveying my thoughts on what I can take away from there. If you really care about this and are gonna be posting about it online, please stay up to date on newer things that could have come out after this video was just even edited, not even posted. And the final words I think you should take away are what Jennifer Hale's statement on the matter is. Anyone who knows me or has followed my career will know that I have great respect for my peers and that I am an advocate for all members of the community. I am under NDA and not at liberty to speak regarding the situation. My reputation speaks for itself. What a baller response. But this has just been your latest episode of Fantasy News. Let me know what you think around the last story or any of them throughout the day in the comments down below. Any likes or comments really help with engagement in my career is how I'm gonna phrase it, I guess, today. That's honest. And if you'd like to support me even more, I got books, I got merch, a Patreon, and have a good one, y'all. Love ya, peace.